quickly, let me just share with you uh, about North Carolina. I live in North Carolina now for 11 years. That's where I minister as a missionary. But it all started uh, when I was 10 years old. There was an American evangelist who came to General Santo City, shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I was 10, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. So that's where my journey started. And then I never knew that, you know, God... At 19 years old, when I was in college in the Philippines, uh, or in Philippines, in Manila, we're in the Philippines now, uh, in Manila, uh, God uh, redirected my life, and He was directing me towards uh, pastoral ministry. So I didn't know what that means at that time, but I know my next step was to be trained. So I went to PBTS, uh, because this is the seminary I know that if... I've heard, you know, from my pastor, if God has called you in the ministry, you have to go to the seminary. So I went to PBTS, and uh, to my surprise, at second year uh, college, I have 72 units. And then I realized for you to be enrolled in PBTS, you need 72 units, if I'm not wrong. Is that right? Yeah, you, you need 72 units to get admitted to PBTS. So I just have enough units to be admitted here in PBTS. And my first uh, semester, I struggled because I don't know how to study. I never went to libraries to read books and do my homeworks. I survived by copying from my classmates. So, uh, <laughs> so when I went to the seminary, uh, one thing that I struggled with is because I have to learn how to study. I have to learn how to read books. I have to learn, you know, how to... Uh, just prepare myself for exams. So in my first semester here, I struggled. In fact, our academic dean secretly called me, and he told me at the end of the first semester, our term, first term, he called me and he told me, uh, your grade, uh, uh, it's on the edge. We'll give you grace to move to the next term, but if you can't make it on the next term, if you, your grade will not improve, uh, we're, you know, we're afraid we need to send you back home. Uh, you know, that's shocking to me because I know God has called me. I know I need to be here in the seminary, but God used that actually to challenge me to learn how to study. So when I graduated, I was uh, one of the top five because there's only five of us who graduated. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, 1987, I graduated uh, part of that batch and then went back to Mindanao. And then after two years, uh, I met a girl. Uh, she was introduced to me by my brother. I look at her face. I look at her legs. I said, this is it. This is the woman. This is the woman I, wa I want to marry. So I married my wife uh, 27 years ago uh, after I saw her face and her legs. Uh, but she was wearing a skirt. So just up, you know, just down, you know, the knee. So, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, so, but 1995, after five years of being married, God called us to San Diego. Uh, San Diego, I never heard about San Diego, never heard about California, but that's, it's another long story, but I just want to summarize. You know, I never heard of a place like uh, San Diego, but God brought us there through connections, through relationships. So one thing I learned about ministry is this. Uh, if God gives you an opportunity to partner, to make friends, to have relationships, you know, just to help someone in their ministry, help that, you know, person. And, of course, not because you have a selfish agenda, but because God is opening an opportunity for you, you know, to, to partner with somebody. And because of that partnership and friendship, God brought us there. I, I, I never knew that. So at that time. But anyway, when we got to San Diego, our two boys were born in San Diego. Uh, they're now 21 years old and 18 years old. Uh, so um, in San Diego, I learned so many things. And this is another area as a missionary I learned. I need to learn to adjust with the uh, uh, culture where God has called me. Uh, I can't be, uh, I can't stay, you know, the way I was in the Philippines and then be effective as a missionary in America. So I learned so many things. I learned to, I need to learn how to drive uh, Amer uh, American way in America. Because when I went there, I was driving like a Filipino uh, driving, you know, in America. So when I got my first uh, traffic ticket, which is very expensive because I did not stop in a four-way stop. Because doon kasi, pag may four-way stop, di ba, may sign na stop. Kahit walang police, you have to stop. 
Ganon doon eh, sa Amerika. Dito sa atin, uh, suggestion lang naman yung mga sign, di ba? So, so when I... When I got my uh, license, I started uh, driving. I got so excited. The first day I got my driver's license, uh, I was talking to a friend. I was so excited. I never know. I didn't notice there was a four-way stop. I did not stop, and just behind me was a policeman. So the first day I got my my license, I also got my first traffic ticket. Very expensive, three hundred dollars plus. So that was a very expensive lesson, but I learned. I realized I need to adjust in my driving the way Americans drive in America. So, so isa yun mga na-learn ko, may cross-cultural aspect. So, and, and of course, uh, there's so many things I learned uh, in America. But one thing I learned is that, uh, going back to Pastor Alan said, that sense of calling. I went to America because I know God has called me there. I never know about the place, about the people, but I'm willing, you know, to be transformed, to be reshaped, so God can use me effectively in that area. So, is yon. And then, God called us to, uh, to North Carolina to plant a church. So, I was in San Diego uh, pastoring a church, a Filipino church for 11 years, the same church. And then, God invited us to go to North Carolina. In North Carolina, now for 11 years, uh, I'm no longer a pastor in North Carolina, but I work with pastors and church planters. So I work with the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina, a senior church planting consultant for Asian ministries. So that means I work with Nepalis, Burmese, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Filipinos, uh, and also Europeans, Africans, Middle Eastern, uh, Muslim background churches. So I, I look back, you know, how did I end up here working with different languages? I only know Ilongo, Cebuano, Tagalog, and a little English, right? And uh, a big smile. So, uh, but anyway, one thing I learned is that where God has called you, He will teach you. He will equip you. He will train you. And, you know, what you need to do is just to be humble, to learn, and uh, to be willing to trust Him that He can use you. And so that's one thing I learned about, about Mission Field. That in, in North Carolina, I work with different languages. In fact, for 10 years, God used me to help uh, 130 new churches in North Carolina. In North Carolina, we plant 100 churches average. Uh, because North Carolina is one of the biggest uh, state in, in as far as Southern Baptist work is concerned. Uh, there's 2 million Southern Baptist members in North Carolina alone, 4,500 churches, Southern Baptist churches in North Carolina alone. So, um, so it's no surprise God will use this state to plant an average of 100 churches a year, you know, from different ethnic groups. So that's, that's my experience. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to reiterate, uh, America... We need Filipino missionaries in America. Of course, not just Filipino missionaries. We need Nepali missionaries. And God is sending missionaries in America. Because why? America is the second largest mission field in the world as far as unreached people groups is concerned. Because God has brought the nations in the United States of America. And God wants to reach these nations. Because people that God has moved in America, especially Filipinos and from other countries, they are hungry for God. Remember the book of Acts said, you know, it is God who determined the exact time, the exact place, where we should live. So that, there's a purpose, so that we may seek, so that we may seek God. And people that God has brought in America from different nations, they are seeking. They are seeking for something eternal, something significant in the spiritual. So please pray for us. And our prayer, you as uh, our partners here in the Philippines, that you continue to shape uh, and, you know, to begin to think how you can get ready when God will bring you to different nations. So start uh, learning cross-cultural. Start taking cross-cultural education. That's why I like Nehemiah teams, because they're teaching us cross-cultural and I, and I, I know it's not just about cross-cultural because there's also a cross choral uh, ministry, you know, just across the street, uh, just across your choral, 
uh, right? In your, <laughs> that's what, you know, I learned from Pastor Nono, by the way. But cross-cultural means, you know, while you're here, get ready because you don't know what time and where God will bring you to reach the nations. Because in Revelation 7, 9, God's focus is to reach the nations. And His desire is to be worshipped by all the nations that He made and created. So we're excited and thank you very much for the opportunity you've given us to share God's stories of uh, drawing people unto Himself and how He's equipping and training uh, Filipinos that He's scattered in different parts of the world. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your prayers and partnerships. And uh, again, uh, please start in your Bible studies, in your churches, in your convention, in your association. Start thinking how you can prepare cross-culturally, you know, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make disciples beyond Filipinos. Because Filipinos in North America are being used to reach not just Filipinos. God's using us to reach other nations that he brought to America. And that's how God wants you to be prepared because you don't know God, how, when and where God will send you. Amen? <laughs>